Hello and welcome to Crontendo episode 12. Today we're looking at another 15 games released for the Famicom. In this case, between November and December of 1986. Now at this point in time, we are really sort of entering the holiday season in Japan, and you're going to see a dramatic increase in the number of games released for the Famicom. This, of course, was true last year as well, but whereas 1985 saw, I believe, only around 27 games released in the months of November and December, 1986 will see around 47. Furthermore, we're going to see a lot of games that are released by companies whose primary business is not making video games. In fact, in this episode, I think around half of the games are released by companies that are normally record companies, animation companies, those sorts of things. Because of the incredible popularity of the Famicom in Japan at this point, really everyone was trying to get into the video game market. Unfortunately, this means that some terrible, terrible games are being released, but on the other hand, we have some pretty good games this episode as well. I must say that this is some of the most grating music I've heard on the Famicom so far. However, I guess this intro is reasonably cool. This game is Agina no Yogen. At least I hope that's how it's pronounced. Probably it's not pronounced Agina. Now, upon seeing this, you might think, well, this looks kind of like Ninja Kid. And the actual uh, game idea is pretty similar. You'd enter each little portal on the overworld, then go through several several levels, and then uh, go back to the overworld and do the next portal. Additionally, in each dungeon, you seem to be looking for a piece of this star-shaped object. I believe there is one piece hidden in each dungeon. This is quite similar, of course, to the plot of Legend of Zelda. However, the actual gameplay is quite different than either of these games. You actually have no direct offensive capabilities. Rather, you use little spigot things to shoot monsters on either side of you. After you've shot a certain number, a little exit will appear, and you can go on to the next level. Oh, you see the little exit ladder right there. Also, you'll find various hidden items, such as keys, which can be used to unlock treasure chests. In other words, this is your basic uh, action-adventure uh, RPG elements, kind of with a rather bizarre gameplay idea added in. Also notable, this is the first game from Vic Tokai for the Famicom. In fact, this is probably one of the first games that Vic Tokai developed. Tokai is actually an established Japanese utility company, and Vic Tokai is their telecommunications branch. The VIC is, uh, stands for Valuable Information and Communication. In 1986, they started developing uh, and publishing video games. And they're also known in the U.S. Uh, for having released some video games that did not actually originally publish themselves. For example, Bump and Jump was originally on Data East in the U.S. It was published by Vic Takai. They started publishing and developing video games in 1986 and got out of the uh, video game business in a, sometime in the late 90s. Here is where I use one of the power-ups. This will swirl around and kill any monsters. Any power-ups you have will be, or any objects you have, will be listed up at the uh, top of the screen there. You also uh, collect money and buy things in little shops that you find occasionally. Uh, there's the entrance up near the top of the screen there. There's actually a little wizard dude who lives up there and will give you helpful advice. Well, not really helpful. Now, up until this point, the game was playable, if certainly not exceptional. However, once I got to the first boss, the whole game sort of uh, falls apart. What you need to do here is to jump over him, grab the first piece of the little star doohickey, and then escape by jumping back on the block and getting up to the exit. Unfortunately, uh, it's actually quite difficult. You can't kill him, you have no weapons on you, really. You need to simply jump over him and jump back on the block, and because the jumping controls in this game are so weird, I simply could not get back on that block. It's also virtually impossible to jump over him. Um, I tried this numerous times, kept getting killed, and eventually gave up. So I really uh, can't recommend this game. 
At this point, it pretty much ceases to be any fun at all. Our second game this episode is the utterly infamous Ganzo Sayuki Super Monkey Daiboken, a premium example of what they call Kusoge in the East. That is, literally, a shitty game. First off, despite being a cartridge, Super Monkey seems to have loading times for some mysterious reason. Now, Sayuki is what the Japanese call the Chinese novel Journey to the West which, as you recall, was also the inspiration for the game Sun Sun, as well as countless Japanese comics, TV shows, and cartoons. Right away you'll notice the graphics look almost like those from an earlier generation of video game consoles. They have a sort of Atari 2600 feel to them. You'll probably also notice that you just seem to be sort of wandering around this little island with nothing to do. Uh, you can explore the island, but there nothing actually ever really seems to occur on it. This is probably the first frustration gamers will encounter when they pick up this game is, uh, hey, I'm just sort of wandering around. There's nothing going on here. No enemies, really nothing at all. Well, eventually you might figure out that you'll need to actually enter the little mountain range, the suspiciously green mountain range there. And once you uh, actually enter that and sort of walk into the mountains, you will find yourself transported mysteriously uh, someplace else. Where exactly you are now, I'm not sure, but it is sort of an, an open uh, field here. You're sort of on the uh, overworld section of the game. Eventually, after more wandering around, you'll find a little house. Quite small and not very noticeable there. You enter it, and then... You see a person, you see some stuff, and... Suddenly, you are back out on the overworld. What actually happened is you picked up some food and water, necessary for survival. If you don't come across these little houses, eventually your characters will die of thirst or starvation. At this point you then continue to wander endlessly around the huge overworld, and this game really is huge. There's sort of miles and miles of nothing in this game, and I guess you should just sort of try to head in a general westernly direction. Now many gamers' reactions, even Japan, is, well, what exactly am I supposed to be doing here? And not much seems to be happening. However, there are random enemy encounters where the action switches to a side view. However, these action scenes are so badly done, they're a little bit difficult to interpret. But it seems that you mostly sort of jump around up in the air and hit enemies with your stick. Though, of course, uh, you know, there's nothing even remotely resembling good gameplay here. By the way, that little dragon guy seems to be on your team. Well, after a little while, this scene will end, almost as suddenly as it began, and you'll be back on the overworld. Ah, finally done. Okay. There it ends, and there's a loading screen, and you are back to more exciting walking action. Along the way, you'll pick up some of your friends, and there is a, supposedly even some sort of boss in this game, but Super Monkey Die Booken seems to consist of around 90% walking across the overworld at excruciatingly slow speed. Almost as if the makers of this game wanted to depict a passage across China in real time. So, who is responsible for this? Well, this is the first Famicom release from VAP, Video and Audio Project, a Japanese music and television company. As for the developers, they have wisely chosen to remain anonymous. And of course, Super Monkey Daiboken does have a cult following in Japan, and is considered to be one of the absolute worst games ever made. Admittedly, of all the games I've played for the Famicom so far, this seems the least like a real game, the way it alternates between absurdly long, boring walking sequences, and then these brief, incomprehensible battle sequences. This game seems to be developed by individuals who really have no idea of what a video game is. So there definitely are some bad games for the Famicom and the NES, but I don't know that really anything I've seen so far quite compares to Super Monkey Daiboken. Unless I come across something else really bad, this is probably going to get the title of Worst Famicom Game Ever.
Hooray! It's another game from Toei and Showy System, the same team that brought us that pile of shit, Hakodo no Ken. Nagagutsu Ohida Neko features Pero, Toei's mascot. Pero is taken from Toei's 1969 film of the same name, based on the well-known fairy tale Puss in Boots. The film is notable for the involvement of the young Hayao Miyazaki, who is probably the most well-known figure in Japanese animation today, due to the international attention that his films such as My Neighbor Totoro and Spirit Away have received. However, the game we are looking at now is actually based on Toei's 1976 sequel, known in the West as Puss in Boots Travels Around the World. Toei's game is a pretty standard run, jump, and shoot kind of platformer. At the end of each level, you'll face, well, the exact same boss over and over again, green dragon that shoots fireballs at you. Whoops, there's the old I got hit with a fireball just as I was finishing off the boss. A little mouse comes and drags your lifeless corpse away whenever this happens. You can actually get hit several times per life. The little P equals two errors for into the number of hits you have left, and you have three lives. So the game is reasonably generous with its lives. Altogether there's, oh, I would say, what is that, eight different levels there? And there's a certain amount of variation between the levels. Uh, this level right here obviously takes place on the ocean with a little boat that can jump up in the air somehow. You defeat pirate ships, whales, uh, lightning bolts, all kinds of silly things. This game is actually quite a bit better than Hakodo no Ken. It's not great, but it's certainly reasonably playable. The graphics are a lot better than Hakodo no Ken. The game is, uh, well, it looks like a kid's game, but it can actually be a bit tricky in spots. All those little bolts of uh, ball lightning, whatever those are, those are relatively difficult to shoot and to dodge. Now, it's often stated that this game was released in the United States as Puss in Boots, Perro's Great Adventure. However, that's not really the case. If you've actually played both of these games, you'll find out they're more or less completely different games. They just happen to use some of the same sprites. The actual level and gameplay is quite a bit different, and uh, Puss in Boots does have a lot of sort of more advanced platforming features, uh, which is not surprising considering it was made two years later. So I guess we'd have to consider Puss in Boots to be more of a uh, US-only sequel to a Japan-only game. But I would definitely not consider these to be the same game. Well, here we're back to the original uh, Nugutsu. And uh, this level takes place in oh, India, I believe? The actual goal of this game is to get Peril around the world in 80 days. You can see a little timer going by there. I currently have 36 days left. You start off with 80 days. I guess we really shouldn't judge this game too harshly. While it's no, uh, not exactly the best thing to come out of the Famicom, Toei has certainly released worse, that's for sure, and it's, I suppose, reasonably playable, so you might as well give it a shot. Well, ninjas may have disappeared from the Famicom for the time being, but we still have plenty of shoot 'em ups. This is the second best shoot 'em up this episode. This is Konami's Moero Twinbee. And this game is a Famicom only sequel to Konami's arcade game. And there's actually a plot to this game. The subtitle means something along the lines of Rescue Dr. Cinnamon. And as you may or may not know, Dr. Cinnamon is the scientist who actually created Twin B and his little friends. Here he's been kidnapped by, well, aliens? I'm not really sure. One interesting thing about the Japanese version is it actually allows for three players. This is done by using the Japanese uh, four-way adapter. Konami did release this game in the US, but since the Twin B franchise was not known, they released it under the name Stinger. And if I'm not mistaken, this may have been the only Twin B game to be released for the Famicom in the U.S. For some reason, in the U.S. version, the uh, Dr. Timmons hideout is uh, described as being the Konami headquarters, and the person being kidnapped is perhaps a Konami designer? 
Now this game does deviate just a little bit from the original twin B game idea in that you alternate between horizontal and vertical scrolling levels. The first twin B game was strictly vertical only levels. I suppose one thing that might surprise you about this game is the number of crosses that appear in it. I thought those things weren't allowed by Nintendo of America. As before, you collect power-ups by shooting the clouds, little bells will pop out. If you grab them when they're gold, you'll get points. If you shoot them a certain number of times, they'll change color, and then you'll get a power-up depending on what color. For example, blue is a speed-up, I'm going to hit it until it turns silver, and then I've got double firepower. And you'll really need to try to utilize a lot of power-ups in this game before I get very far. Coming across the first boss here, Twin B being a cube-up type game, all the bosses are quite eccentric looking, like it's a uh, watermelon shooting watermelon seeds at you. Though, I'm not sure in Japan do watermelons have green seeds. I should mention that despite the fact this game is quite cute and charming looking, it really is a very serious shoot 'em up and is uh, very well designed. Some people don't like this game quite as much as the original Twin B or some of the sequels because of the horizontal shooting levels, but I think they work relatively well. Get the little Konami logo there for a few, some additional points. In the vertical levels, you'll need to use both buttons to fire both the laser beams and the bombs. Collecting the L and the R will sort of power you up again, allowing you to do like a rear laser as well as the front. Some of the best power-ups are actually not found in the bells, but rather by bombing things on the ground. Here we've powered up to a full-fledged death machine with spread shot and a shield. The spread shot can actually make some of the bosses much easier than they would be without it. This guy, for example, is a piece of cake with the spread shot. And of course, as is typical for games of this era, there is a bonus round where you simply shoot bells and get points. So while Moro Twin B is sort of regarded as the black sheep in the Twin B family, it's actually a pretty good game. In some ways it's more enjoyable than the original Twin B, has a few more additional elements added into it, and I would hardly recommend it if you're looking for a good shooter on the Famicom. On any normal episode, this would probably be far and away the best shooter of the episode, and the Twin B series is really sort of a good example of great games that didn't get released in the US for some reason or another. And once again, while playing this game, I am quite impressed by the consistent level of quality Konami gives to its Famicom games. Next up is Ikari, or Ikari Warriors, as it is known in the US. This is a port of the 1986 arcade game, and was one of the first big hits from SNK. Ikari, by the way, is usually translated as Anger in English. Now, SNK had already published one title for the Famicom, ASO, but for some reason, Ikari was published by K Amusement. It was eventually released in the US by SNK themselves. Now the arcade release is considered to be a classic run and gun. It took the formula of Capcom's Commando and a number of new features. For one, it had a very unusual control mechanism. It used a rotary joystick. That is, the joystick actually had a knob that could be rotated, so you could control your direction of fire. This would allow you to move in one direction while firing in a different direction. Unfortunately, the Famicom port is not nearly as highly regarded as the arcade release, to say the least. The characters' names are either Ralph and Clark, or Paul and Vince in this version. Obviously, the characters seem to have been inspired by John Rambo from the Rambo movies. Both the arcade and the Famicom version allow for a two-player cooperative, which makes the game a bit more approachable. Trying to get through it with one player is virtually impossible. Just like in Commando, you move up the screen, shooting anybody that gets in your way. You can also throw grenades to do more damage. Unlike Commando, you have limited bullets and must occasionally pick up ammo. Now one thing that is quite fun about this game is you will occasionally find vehicles, such as this tank here, that you can jump into. 
This will basically turn you into an unstoppable death machine, and make certain portions of the game much easier to get through. I would advise hanging onto the tank as long as possible. You can still be damaged by grenades and rockets, however. Additionally, you'll find various power-ups throughout the game, such as uh, speed increases, more powerful grenades, that sort of thing, as well as more advanced power-ups, such as a heart, which allows you to keep your power-ups after you die. Also, much like Commando, you will travel through sections uh, separated by heavily guarded gates, though one feature is that there's actually bosses in this game. For example, in a few moments we'll come across a uh, super tank. As you can see, the environments in Ikari are much more varied than in Commando. You go through all kinds of unusual bridges, villages, all sorts of interesting things. One thing about Commando is it was pretty repetitive. Here's the first boss. You'll need to blow him up with your grenades. However, there is one really big difference between Commando and Ikari, and that's that while the Famicom Commando is highly regarded, opinion on Ikari is much more divided. Some folks actually like the game, while others feel it's one of the worst games ever released for the system. I've actually heard Ikari called the worst Nintendo game. More than anything else, this might be due to the difficult controls. With no rotary joystick, the game becomes much more difficult to play. And frankly, the controls in this game are really not very good. I sometimes found myself throwing grenades in a different direction than I originally intended. And in general, aiming is somewhat tricky. Watch this right here, for example. I'm trying to blow that guy up. Whoops. Additionally, some critics have had issues with the graphics and the sometimes weird color schemes. Not to mention the somewhat silly-looking sprites on your character. The legs, are, in particular, are kind of goofy-looking. Now, much of this is probably due to the fact that this conversion was done by Micronix, the same guy who do those rather sketchy Capcom ports. You will definitely see Micronics' signature sprite flicker throughout this game. Still, having just played Commando last episode, I really can't be too hard on this game. Uh, yeah, there are definitely some technical issues, and there are some frustrating moments, but there's also a lot of really fun moments as well. Um, there is definitely a lot more gameplay variety in Ikari Warriors than there is in Commando. The game is also much, much, much longer, maybe even a little bit too long. It's quite difficult to actually get through it. So while this is definitely not a great game, it's not nearly as bad as its reputation seems. Um, once you get the hang of the controls, you'll probably find yourself having a bit of fun. Well, here is something we'll start seeing occasionally, and is certainly a sign of the growing importance of home consoles in the video game industry a console-only sequel to an arcade game. Mappy Land is a Famicom original and a sequel to Namco's 1983 arcade game Mappy, which was released um, as a port on the Famicom way back in late 1984. Not surprisingly, Mappy Land has been given a bit of a Super Mario-like makeover, and uh, Mappy journeys through various locales collecting pieces of cheese. You need to collect all the cheese to find the exit and then move on to the next level. Each level has a different theme. For example, this one here is obviously sort of Wild Westy. And a different method for slowing down the cats that were chasing you. In Mappy, you uh, had little microwaves that sent uh, waves of radiation to stop the cats. In this game, you have all sorts of things. As in the Japanese version of Mappy, the adult cat is named Namco rather than Goro. Most of the time, Mappy's a pretty fun game. Uh, this level definitely has the most violent method for dealing with the cats. You can drop a bomb that'll actually send them flying to the air and then exploding into tiny little pieces, which is pretty gruesome. Now, some of the elements of Mappy are actually not very successful, such as this level, which is more of a traditional platformer level. You need to jump across vines, avoid falling in the water, so on and so forth. This actually controls quite a bit differently than the rest of the game, and feels a little out of place. Sort of like an interruption in a mostly otherwise fun game. Then we have this rather spooky, almost Castlevania-like level, in which you are armed with some sort of ghost-busting device and use balloons to fly around. While I like this level, it doesn't really feel consistent with the rest of Mappy Land. 
Now this scene right here would seem to obviously violate Nintendo of America's rules about religious symbols, but uh, well, there it is. And at the end of this uh, very first world here, you have this uh, rather annoying little section, a time section, where you have to collect all the pieces of cheese in the shortest possible amount of time. And this is actually pretty strict. And I had to try this several times, always being late by just a second or two to the party. And of course you have to keep trying it over and over again until you finally get it right. After this you go into World 2 where you're collecting rings instead of cheese, otherwise exactly the same. So Mappy Land uh, it's definitely fun in places, um, but probably a little too inconsistent to be considered a great game. The holiday season can only mean one thing in the video game world, lame games based on licensed properties. In this case, it's Akira Toriyama's extremely popular manga and anime, Dragon Ball. This is the first of many, many Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z video games. In fact, there would be nine games released for the Famicom alone. The series certainly didn't get off to a very auspicious start with this offering, courtesy of Bandai and Toza. We'll be using an unofficial translation so we can actually read the dialogue scenes. You play Sun Goku, who is clearly based on Sun Wukong, the Monkey King. So this is actually the second Sun Wukong game we'll be seeing this episode. Dragon Ball bears a resemblance to the overworld portion of Zelda, only this game is pretty linear. On the first level you run around bopping guys and eventually enter a room with a boss. The bosses on the first level are pretty straightforward, simply run up and hit him. However, Goku has a pretty short reach, so unless you found the hidden staff weapon, you'll, you'll probably take some damage every time you hit him. Dragon Ball is moderately enhanced by the addition of a few weapons and power-ups. Now for some reason, Bandai liked releasing their games in the United States, even though they were usually based on cartoon series that were not well known over here. So just like their previous titles, Dragon Ball was reworked and released in the US as Dragon Power. Very little has actually changed, however. The character sprite of Goku was changed to give him sort of a little monkey face. And of course on the American box art there was a completely generic karate type guy jumping around for some reason. The basic plot is pretty much the same, however. Of course, American gamers were still at a bit of a disadvantage because without having read the Dragon Ball comic book, this game still didn't make any sense, even the Americanized version. However, there was ra one rather notorious change made in the American version, and that was in the uh, cutscene involving the Turtle Hermit. In Dragon Ball, this Turtle Hermit character, Muten Roshi, uh, demands to see Bulma's panties. Obviously this wouldn't fly with Nintendo of America's family-friendly policies, so they had to remove this part. I've always found this particular scene to be a little disturbing here, as the various panties fly around his head, he appears to start vomiting blood? Well, at any rate, in the American version, the panties were changed to sandwiches. In fact, uh, the panties are actually sort of a power-up in the Dragon Ball game. Uh, you get them and you get a burst of extra speed for some reason. So they were actually changed to sandwiches consistently throughout the game. Well, regardless of these relatively minor changes, um, both versions are sort of saddled with rather irritating and unresting gameplay for most of the game. For example, in the next level, you have to run around looking for Oolong, and you do this by running into all these little houses and hitting on these various figures here. Oolong is hidden randomly in one of these. If you get unlucky, this can actually take quite some time. Which brings up to another major problem with uh, Dragon Ball and Dragon Power. Namely, you have a life meter. However, not only are my points deducted from the life meter when you take damage, 
but it's also constantly draining as you play the game, just like a timer. Enemies will sometimes drop items that were a few, a few life points, and I mean literally a few life points. However, these items are random and aren't dropped consistently. This wouldn't be so bad, except your life meter is not refilled when you complete a level. So if you took some damage during a boss fight, your odds of getting to the next level are greatly diminished. And since the life refills are so random, you can sometimes go a very long time without finding one. So if you're running low on life and none of the enemies have dropped life refills, you're pretty much screwed. As you can see here, I've taken some damage and I'm running quite low on life. And there really isn't much of a chance for me to find a new way of refilling it at this point. So Dragon Ball boils down to being just another mediocre game from Toza. I assume it sold quite well regardless, though future Dragon Ball games will be based on an entirely different formula. Hey there, puzzle game fans! Irem enters the FDS arena with this little game. That's actually a uh, pretty nice music there. Now, this game was not developed by Irem themselves originally. You notice it's licensed from a Sadato Taneta. I'm not sure who this mysterious figure is, but I can only assume he's the guy who originally designed the game. The title is Monitor Puzzle Kaneko, The Kinetic Connection, but it was also released for the MSX by Sony as just The Kinetic Connection. It was even released in the United States for the Commodore 64 by Electronic Arts, of all people. Once the game finally loads, you're taken to the image select screen. You choose against several different uh, images there, ranked in difficulty. You then select how many pieces you want. You can also view the completed puzzle if you'd like. Or you can be hardcore and try it without having seen the complete image. Because we're complete wusses, we're going to try it at the easiest uh, image setting as well as the smallest number of pieces. So this is a rather interesting and unique idea. This is a puzzle, just like a jigsaw puzzle, only the uh, picture is actually moving. You simply grab a piece, put it in its proper place on the, uh, the blank screen there, and then uh, continue to assemble the picture. Use the D-pad and the uh, B button to select a piece, then simply just pop it into place. Now as it turns out, the pieces are all often not facing the right direction. You can use those buttons to either uh, flip them upside down or flip them horizontally. As you can see there, one piece is actually uh, backwards, so we'll need to, to flip that one over. As you may have noticed, there's a little timer there in the background. It's also, you can uh, compare how you're doing with the, uh, the best score, which is uh, currently at 7 minutes and 54 seconds. Ah, so we're finally done here once we flip that last piece. We well, might think, ah, this looks pretty simple, but of course this is the very easiest picture and the very easiest setting. The other uh, pictures, well, the game can actually get <laughs> extremely mind-bogglingly difficult. Um, let's take a look at uh, image number 10, and then we'll go to the largest number of pieces. And, oh my god, it's just uh, cherry blossom leaves falling in the wind or something. How can you possibly even consider putting this thing together? Uh, this one is a real uh, mind blower, that's for sure. Um, I noticed that the uh, record time on this was like an hour and 51 minutes for whoever had this disc image originally. So uh, if you're looking for a challenging jigsaw puzzle style video game, uh, I guess this is the one.
our next release is known as Castle Excellent in Japan and Castle Quest in the United States. It was published and developed by ASCII, a company that seems to specialize in games for Japanese computers. Castle Excellent was also released on the MSX at around the same time. Now this game is in fact a sequel to a 1985 MSX title called The Castle. This is the castle right here. Castle Excellent is essentially a bigger, better update on the castle, um, and that exactly is what the Excellent in the title is supposed to imply. The NES port was actually handled by Bits Laboratory. You would probably classify the castle games as puzzlish platformers, similar in feel to Load Runner. The goal is simply to get through the various interconnected rooms in this maze-like castle and rescue a princess, avoiding the many, many monsters and hazards found in every single room. Altogether, there are a hundred rooms. The catch is that the doors between the rooms are locked. You will need a key of the correct color in order to open a door, and the keys will actually disappear after one use. As a result, there's a lot of trial and error in this game, since you often don't know what's in the next room until you open it. And since the keys are in general in very short supply, you'll often find yourself trapped and have to start over. This game was also released in the United States by Nexoft, which was simply a division of ASCII used for releasing carts in the United States. The cover made it look more like a standard fantasy adventure type game. The main difference was that you had many more lives in the US version. You were quite vulnerable to monster attacks, and even though you have an extremely short dagger with virtually uh, no reach at all, you will occasionally be able to defend yourselves against the enemies. Some monsters, such as that green guy with a pink hat, are not, not able to be harmed by your sword, so you'll simply have to avoid them. One thing I don't like about Castle Excellent is that the controls are pretty screwy. You can jump, but you can actually sort of levitate in the air for a second. However, in general I find it sort of difficult to jump correctly, and some of the uh, obstacles in this game do require some very precise jumping, so I found myself getting killed quite frequently trying to jump over things. Despite the fact that the US version gives you a whole bunch of lives, I found myself dying very frequently and using up the lives pretty quickly. So while Castle Quest is a pretty cool game, just expect to run into dead ends quite frequently, and it's probably going to take you quite a while to get all the way through the game. Well, we've seen a lot of shoot 'em ups on the Famicom so far, but finally we've come to one of the all time great shoot 'em ups for the system, Xanic, or Xanic AI to give the full title. Xanic AI is a revised version of an earlier 1986 MSX game, which we see here. Xanic was pretty decent for an MSX title, but the Famicom version really took the console's shooter to a whole new level. First of all, we should note that Xanic is an early title from Compile, which would go on to become perhaps the greatest developer of shooters for home systems. Now, one of the things about Compile is they were real technical wizards, and Xanic somehow manages to present very fast gameplay with a large number of sprites while avoiding flicker and sh uh, slowdown. How this was accomplished, I really have no idea, but compare this to a Micronix title, such as Sun Sun, and see the difference between good and bad programming for the Famicom. Even more surprisingly, Xanic utilizes a relatively aggressive sort of AI, where the game becomes more difficult depending on how you play it. For example, grabbing the shield power-up, like I've done here, will cause all sorts of difficult enemies to flood the screen. Suddenly all these missiles end up being shot at you. The shield is one of several secondary weapons found throughout the game, and you can also uh, use the primary laser, and this can be upgraded by occasionally shooting those little blocks and getting the glowing uh, orbs that appear out of them. Here's one of the many bosses in the game. Um, defeating him will require you to shoot at all the little uh, laser firing vents there. Early levels like this are pretty simple, but uh, get a few levels into the game and suddenly it becomes pretty hectic. 
The power-ups that you get in the game are all quite different. For example, the shield is quite handy for protecting you against enemy fire, but then you're stuck using your uh, regular laser weapon. Of course, the laser weapon does get better the more you upgrade it. Now, once you've defeated this enemy, you'll then go on to the next level. There's sort of a little uh, warp animation here. Yeah, I guess that's pretty cool. Now, your actual secondary weapon is selected by shooting those various numbers, like the three you just saw there. And if you uh, collect the same number repeatedly, it'll power up your secondary weapon. And definitely some are more useful than the others. Oh, here apparently I've been killed and I'm stuck using my uh, primary secondary weapon or my laser, which is uh, the primary secondary weapon is just sort of this old ball of energy that shoots out. Really not that great. Now, really, Zanuck is one of the first shoot 'em ups to have sort of a modern style variety of weapons. Um, there's actually, oh, what, I think, uh, seven or so in this game. For example, number three is this sort of protective energy ball that circles around you. These kind of things would become pretty common in shoot 'em ups, but really weren't seen that frequently, at least at this point. As you can see, there's quite a few opportunities to uh, collect power ups. Now for this boss, I'm actually using uh, this sort of oscillating ring here, which will destroy, or at least damage, any enemies' hits. Um, it does also make quite a few uh, enemies appear when you use it, unfortunately. But it can be pretty useful for uh, killing bosses. Now, um, one thing about Zanuck that does make this game a little bit on the difficult side is that if you die when you have a power-up, you'll still be stuck with the, uh, the more aggressive enemies. Um, for example, if I were to die like right here, like I just did, it's going to make killing this boss very, very difficult because of the sheer number of enemies that appear on the screen. So yes, Zanuck can be pretty cruel at times. Regardless, Zanuck is still one of the best, most loved shooters for the Famicom and an early classic from Compile. Now here we have sort of a curiosity, Karate Champ by Data East. This is the port of a very popular 1984 arcade game. The original arcade game would go down in the history books as being the first real one-on-one -on -one fighting game. It used a rather unique double joystick configuration to perform moves, as shown here during the demonstration screen. It was also one of the first games to prominently use human speech. This game came out in uh, sometime in the middle of 1984, thus beating out Nintendo's own Famicom title, Urban Champion. Perhaps you remember Urban Champion from Crontendo Episode 2. Karate Champ was one of the first third-party games to be released in the United States. Bandai had released a few titles in October, Capcom released three in November, and Data East released Tag Team Wrestling and Karate Champ. Unlike all those other games, however, Karate Champ had not yet been released in Japan. It was released directly to the U.S. market. Thus, Data East was the first third-party publisher to release games specifically for the U.S., just as Nintendo had done earlier with Gumshoe. Oddly, Data East did eventually decide to release this in Japan. It came out for the Famicom Disk System in 1988. Presumably, they had really nothing else good to release at that time, because it's hard to imagine this making much of a stir. Data East's home conversion had to obviously dramatically alter the control setup. You perform a move by hitting one of the buttons and the D-pad, sort of like a modern fighting game. You can perform various high and low kicks, and there's no life bar. Whoever makes the first hit wins a point. Once you accumulate a certain number of points, you win the round. Then you will get a rather annoying bonus round, which I can't seem to get anywhere with. It involves flower pots being thrown at you. And much like later fighting games, Karate Champ, uh, the rounds take place in different locales, such as a mountaintop, a city alley, a jungle, etc. However, fighting games pretty much live or die by their controls, and this is Karate Champ's major failing. Having the double joystick configuration allowed for around 20 different combinations of joystick positions. The D-pad 2 button setup doesn't really work nearly as well. The control system is very awkward and confusing, and I found it to be very difficult to successfully execute moves. For example, often when I tried to execute the high kick, I would merely jump up in the air instead. Also, the hit detection is very baffling. It's often not clear what counts as a hit and what doesn't. So unfortunately, Karate Champ really fails to live up to its potential, and I don't think fighting game fans are going to enjoy this one very much.
At last, we've reached December 1986, and we'll celebrate by looking at this vertical shoot 'em up, Tiger Heli. Released by Pony Canyon in Japan and Acclaim in the United States, this is a port of the 1985 arcade game, designed by none other than Toplin. In fact, I believe Tiger Heli was Toplin's first shoot 'em up. This is the arcade version here. It's a pretty nice little shoot 'em up. One thing that's a little unusual is that all your enemies are actually land based. You mostly fight tanks and ships and whatnot. You can also destroy civilian vehicles and houses as well. Not really sure what the plot of this game is, but it seems you're some sort of maniacal helicopter pilot pretty much killing everybody you see. This conversion was once again done by Micronix, who seem to be the guys to go to for cheap and dirty conversions at this point. Still, the game is not all bad and does have some nice graphical details like the actual shadow underneath your helicopter. Aside from your missiles, you have a very limited mega bomb. It'll blow up most things on the ground, but not everything. It has sort of limited range. And you can also get power-ups uh, that mostly are actually little mini helicopters that attach themselves to your side and fly along with you, kind of like in Capcom's 1940 games. If this game reminds you a little bit of Gyrodyne, then it's because Toplin was sort of a spin-off from Clax, the company that developed Gyrodyne. Now, Toplin would eventually go on to specialize in shoot 'em ups and release a number of well loved titles such as Twin Cobra, Slap Fight, Zero Wing, Batsugan, and so on. Zero Wing, as you might recall, received quite a bit of notoriety a few years ago when a line of dialogue from the Mega Drive version, All Your Base Are Belong to Us, became a frequently referenced quote on the internet. Toplin eventually went out of business in 1994, but former employees kind of kept the spirit alive with other shoot 'em up developers such as Cave and Aiding. Now, Tiger Heli is definitely not the most original shoot 'em up you will ever see. Obviously, it will remind you quite a bit of games like 1942, but it's still quite a bit of fun and can actually be quite tricky and challenging in spots. Here we see the little helper helicopter guys, and uh, unfortunately, you're also going to see a bit of uh, Micronix's notorious uh, sprite flicker here and there. This becomes especially bad in the, uh, the boss fight coming up in a little bit here. Most of the enemies are relatively slow moving, but there sometimes can be quite a few of them. They also tend to sneak up behind you as well. All in all, I'd say this is definitely not a great game like Xanic, but it certainly is playable. One wishes that Micronix had done a better job. Here we're coming up to uh, one of the bosses. It's these two large tanks, and as you can see, there's enough flicker here to give you a seizure. Additionally, the bosses don't really explode or anything when you shoot them. They just sort of shut down. So if you're a shoot 'em up fan, it's definitely worth a bit of your time to take a look at this. Here's another game published by the Japanese record company, Toshiba EMI, and so far they haven't really been known for putting out quality games. This game, Daiva, or Daiva Imperial of Nir Sarsha, is a bit of an oddity. Daiva was developed by t and Soft to have their name proudly displayed on the box cover, and they're the same guys who made Hydlide, so really they shouldn't be bragging too much. At first glance, this looks sort of like a Star Raiders ripoff, which it is, but with a twist. You see, the unusual thing about this game is one of seven games in the Daiva series that was released almost simultaneously around this time. This is number six in the series. Each game was released on a different Japanese system, such as the MSX, the MSX2, the PC-88, and so on and so forth. Naturally, there's nothing on the Sega Master System. This right here is the MSX2 version. The overall uh, idea is similar, though this game seems a bit more complex. Also at the same time, there was released a comic book, a soundtrack album, so there was really quite a media blitz behind this unique concept of releasing seven games at once. Presumably, they were expecting it to do pretty well, and you might be a little surprised to learn that Daiva was one of the pricier Famicom games released so far at uh, 5,500 yen. 
So anyway, back to the Famicom version. Uh, you select a planet from the map screen and actually have to manually uh, pilot your ship there. And then you decide where you want to drop the missiles, the health refill, and the bomb. You can place them at certain points along level, giving Naiva sort of a uh, certain strategy element. Now here's the twist on the Star Raider's idea. Each planet is a forced scrolling uh, platformer shooting type deal. Of course, you wouldn't expect anything too awesome from the makers of Highlight, so these levels are a little bit on the lame side. Basically, you sort of have your little kind of a, a Gundam style armored suit there, to sort of move around on these rather uh, slippery surfaces and pretty much shoot everything and. Uh, avoid any enemy fire. There's no really points or anything like that, so I'm not really sure what the incentive is for actually shooting things. Here's the missiles kicking in. They just fly across the screen and sort of blow up anything they come across. And we're now coming near the end of the level, and there's my health ref uh, refill. It'll fill up my, my shield there. And finally, here is the boss. It's sort of an odd plant creature, I um, mean, you shoot all the little flowers that are found at the ends of its tendrils. Once you've taken care of this guy, it's really not that difficult. Uh, you then back to the map, and you're on to the next planet. And as you can see, there are uh, quite a few there. And there's really no significant difference between any of the planets, at least none that I've seen so far. Notice just like Hydlide, uh, Teen Soft has sort of a, a fetish for putting the name of the game on the main uh, playing screen there. So once again, you put in your bombs and missiles and so on, and then you do the next planet, and it's, you know, they're all pretty quite similar. They maybe have sort of slightly different themes, but really not a whole lot changes. Now there's also these odd little battle mode sections where the, you sort of fight enemy ships in what appears to be a very primitive turn-based strategy minigame. This is probably the most intriguing element of Daiva, since strategy games would eventually become very popular on home consoles in Japan, and this is really one of the very first hints of that genre. Not that this battle mode is actually any good, however. Um, Daiva, like a lot of titles of this era, shows promise by introducing creative ideas, but ultimately fails due to bad execution. The bottom line is that the individual sections aren't very well handled, and the game ends up being sort of boring and repetitive. As you may have gathered, Convoy No Naza was a Transformers game. The first Transformers game, as a matter of fact. Don't get too excited, however, because Mystery of Convoy, or Convoy with an M, as the box heart says, is a horrible, horrible game. This is what will happen the first time you try to play it. Probably within around two seconds of starting, a Decepticon will fly right into and kill you. This will probably happen a few times, and then you'll put the game away, which is the correct thing to do because this is really a terrible game and no one in their right mind would want to play this piece of crap. The developer, ISCO, has made this game unreasonably hard by means of some rather bizarre decisions on their part. For example, shooting a Decepticon jet will cause it to transform into its robot form. You can't actually shoot these robots because your laser simply sails over their heads. In your vehicle form, shooting the jets will cause them to transform and land on you, instantly killing you. So the first thing you'll learn while playing this game is to not try to kill the enemies, rather just avoid them by jumping over them. Still, enemies will often slam into you from off-screen while you're in mid-jump. Oddly, when you shoot an enemy, it seems to have a brief moment of invulnerability while it transforms. On the other hand, you will be instantly killed with one hit. You can very slowly transform from your robot form to your fire truck form, but neither form is actually very effective at killing enemies. Here's a good example of what happens when you try to shoot a jet as it passes over you. From what I've seen of this game, this is actually the rule rather than the exception. Enemies are literally impossible to hit at times, and are constantly taking cheap shots at you. Your character's capabilities are very limited. In robot form, he can only shoot straight, straight forward and jump. In fire engine form, he can only shoot straight up, and a very worthless little uh, bomb thing he can shoot out in front of him. Actually trying to play through all nine levels of this game would take an enormous amount of dedication. 
Watch here as I try to shoot this Decepticon robot running towards me. The shot will actually just pass right through him. Yet a second ago, I killed a different robot uh, at about the same distance and the shot blew him up. I guess this is just incredibly bad hit detection? Eventually we come to the first level boss. This is another one of those bosses that can only take damage when you shoot him right in the center of his eye. We've all seen variations of this a million times, but because this character, your character is so hard to control, it's actually incredibly annoying trying to actually hit the guy in the eye. Well, Transformers Mystery of Convoy is the Famicom debut from the publisher Takara, an enormous Japanese toy company that actually created the toy lines that were known in the US as Transformers. Eventually, these toys were rebranded as Transformers in Japan as well, though for some reason Optimus Prime was renamed Convoy. ISCO is a little-known Japanese contract developer, and if this is the sort of work that they turn out, they should really be ashamed of themselves. While Transformers is in some sense better than Ganzo Sayuki, this is still a pretty wretched game. In what's starting to be a Crontendo tradition, our last game, Hadamin no Chisoko Tanken, is somewhat of a disappointment. The name being something along the lines of Hot Man's Underground Exploration, and it is the debut Famicom game from Yuse. You probably haven't heard of them, and I can't really tell you much about Yuse, other than they're a minor Japanese publisher of no particular renown. Obviously, this game was inspired by Dig Dug. You don't have a pump, you have some sort of little laser beam. And you can sort of think of Hadamin as being sort of an amped up version of Dig Dug. Or maybe you can think of it as sort of Dig Dug cluttered up by a bunch of unnecessary elements. In Hadaman, you don't just dig around killing monsters, you actually are looking for keys. There's one right there. And once you have four keys, you can actually open up the exit door and go on to the next level. There's also these little caves that'll randomly warp you someplace around the level. Often they warp you back to the exact same cave that you entered into. And actually, uh, certain elements of this game might remind you of Bomberman. You can occasionally uh, find little bombs that allow you to blow up things. Oops, I got fried there. And the fact that you sort of need to uh, a certain number of actions for the exit finally appears. Ah, there it is right there. Is also sort of taken from Bomberman. When we start this first level here, we'll see a key that you'll need a bomb to get to. And there are other things you can look as well. There's a little drill thing there that'll speed you up a bit. The eggs sometimes have helpful items in them. They often have monsters. You'll need to utilize the warp caves in this level in order to find all the keys. So this isn't really a horrible game, it's just sort of an uninspired game. I mean, quite frankly, Dig Dug is more fun than this. I don't really think the addition of power-ups and keys and those sort of things actually makes this game any sort of improvement on Dig Dug. Um, it's basically one of those games that just sort of uh, exists for no reason other than to uh, put something on the shelves and have people uh, pay money for. Well, congratulations go out to Toei Animation for actually not having the worst game this episode. I guess that honor is going to have to go to VAP for Super Monkey Daiboken. Well, make sure you join us for Crontendo Episode 13. Some of the highlights, one of the weirdest, most unplayable games for the Famicom. A game whose uh, reputation leads you to believe it's much worse than it actually is. A couple truly baffling games for the Famicom Disk System. And a pretty good game from Konami. So we will see you then.